Yeah. Okay. Can you explain how people came up with meditation techniques? They seem to be very specific and come from certain people, but how did those people figure it out? Amazing question. Okay. So how did people discover meditation? So, oh man, okay. So supposedly, um, meditation techniques were revealed knowledge. So like someone was doing something and they sort of claimed that they were shown or that this knowledge was revealed to them. And I think what's happened since then is that like once you understand meditation, it's kind of like, like once you understand the principles of the body, the mind, the soul, whatever, whether you believe in it or not, whatever, um, you know, you start to understand like how things work and then you people started to realize like, okay, there's a certain practice for a certain kind of mind. So there are some principles about the mind. For example, you know, the way to calm a mind is not by like holding it in place, oddly enough, but is to let it run out of energy. So if you have like an ADHD mind, you can do a particular kind of technique that sort of slows it down. So like once you understand the principles of the mind, like you understand how the mind works, then you can come up with a meditation technique to guide whatever you want. So I, I think about it this way. Like if you guys play Dota or StarCraft or whatever, like there, there are builds, right? Like you have video games where someone has a build order or like you have a certain like set of like talents or item build or whatever. You have like an item progression. And so how did someone come up with like a build order in StarCraft 2? Like they understood the fundamental like components of the game that's being played. And then they sort of figured out, okay, if I want to get from A to Z, like, and this is, this is what I can work with. How can I get to Z? How can I get to D? How can I get to G? How can I get to H? So it's kind of that way. They, they started by first, like, understanding, the, like, the core of, of, like, how human beings work. And they developed techniques to sort of function on these different levels. So I'll give you guys kind of a couple of other sort of weird esoteric um, answers to that. So the, people say that Shiva, so Shiva is one of the three Hindu trinities. So Hinduism has a bunch of gods. But one of the three main gods is this guy named Shiva. And Shiva, people say that Shiva is basically the first yogi. So Shiva is the, the, is the person or God who gave human beings meditation in the science of yoga. So if you look at Shiva, like he's, like he's not, you look at like pictures of Hindu gods, like they're going to be doing all kinds of stuff, like laying down and like random stuff. Shiva's like usually meditating. That's what he's doing. And so, <coughs> so who Shiva was, I'm not sure. I mean, my sense is that historically there was probably like one teacher or maybe like the concept of one teacher got kind of like immo immemorialized or anthropomorphized as like Shiva. And he's like the original yogi. Some people claim to have been like taught Shiva by Shiva directly. Like they're wandering in the Himalayas and they like go into a cave and there's a guy there who's just like sitting there and that that person will teach them meditation. And they think that that's Shiva. Because there's like, there are stories about that. I mean, I don't, I don't know what to believe there. But so Shiva apparently is the first teacher of meditation. Um, in a more, let me just think for a second if there are other ways to answer that question. Yeah, I guess that's a good answer. So that's sort of like what, what the meditative traditions say. Um, oh, so I, I guess this is an, an, another chance to talk about something. So like, for example, one way that like mantras are developed is there's this idea that when people meditate, they sort of heard this basic universal hum, which is Om. So like Om is sort of the primordial oscillation of the universe. And then if they looked at different sort of versions of Om and they came up with these 12 things called Bij mantras, which are like seeds. And then if you combine each of those Bij mantras has a particular kind of energy. And when you combine those energies in different combinations, you sort of get like a dish. Right. So it's sort of like if I combine different ingredients, like I get a dish. And so those are mantras. So when people like chant like mantras as a form of meditation, those are combinations of these different ingredients. But at the end of the day, someone understood the ingredients. I don't know who that is or how they discovered it or what. But when you do meditation, you'll you'll see what I'm talking about, because when you meditate, for example. Oh, actually, we can. Yes, yeah, so I'm just relating like this is like the theory from the tradition that I learned. I'm not saying it's true or not true, but. Um, yeah, we're going to do meditation questions today. We're going to do all meditation. 
So I'll give you guys just one example of how someone discovered two of the Bij Mantras. So I want you guys to close your eyes and listen to the sound of your breath. So if you listen to the sound of the breath and you, like, what do you, so like the first thing is that there are two different sounds, right? That the sound of inhalation is different from the sound of exhalation. And then if you're brushing your teeth, listen to the sound of brushing your teeth and see if there are two sounds there as well. And then as someone in, in chat points out, it literally, the sound of the breath is the same as the sound of the ocean. So now go and listen to the sound of the ocean. And like, go listen and see if that's the same sound. Okay. The next time you're at the ocean, listen. Close your eyes. Listen to your breath and listen to the sound of the ocean. And so then just like pretend you're a primitive human. Right? And then you're like, well, that's kind of weird. Like, pretend you're, like, alive 5,000 years ago, and you're like, it sounds the same. Does that mean that there's some kind of connection between my breath and the ocean? And so what the way that they discovered the beach mantras is they listened to all of the sounds. This is my theory. They listened to all of the sounds. And they sort of figured out that there are, like, 12 of them that represent all of the phenomenon. And so those are the beach mantras. And then they listened to those 12 sounds and they found one sound that's sort of like underneath all of them. And that's Om. Now, I don't know what to make of that. Like, I, I don't think like as a scientist, I don't know. I mean, th this, these are just, these are the, the teachings of the traditions that I study. I think at the end of the day, I tend to gravitate towards like science and like the first half of of the stream was like lecture, right? So that's what I believe in. I believe in like studying the quality of mind, seeing the way the mind works, looking at it for yourself and trying to understand it, like analyzing the nature of mind, all of this other stuff. Like I can give you guys answers, although it's like, it's a different kind of tradition, right? Because this is all like, do you, do you have faith in it or not? Which is not what I'm about. But what I try to do is like explore this stuff for myself and see what I can figure out. So I do think it's kind of cool, for example, that the sound of the breath, if you listen in the world, you'll hear it in a lot of different places. And I don't know what, like, I don't know what to make of that. Like, I don't know if it's just, you know, the nature of our ears are like restricted with the wavelengths that they can hear. And so we're going to hear common sounds. Like in the same way that our eyes, like, it's kind of like saying like, oh, if I go out into the world, I can like see the same colors everywhere I go. Like, there's seven colors that I see. It's all, like, seven colors, man. Like, it's like everything is connected, man. Seven colors. And it's like, yeah, duh. It's just because our eyes have a limited visual spectrum and we can't see infrared. And so that's just how our eyes perceive color. So, like, maybe the same is true of sound, right? Like, well, let's be scientific about it. So, like, this stuff is, like, the spiritual stuff I think is, like, cool and interesting because I like fantasy games. It's sort of like fantasy games. Like, it's, like, FF like Naruto and chakras and, and all that kind of stuff. Like, I think that stuff is cool. But let's be scientific about it. Right? So I'm just going to answer questions because that's what we're doing today. That's question number one. So it took me like 12 minutes to answer one question. We've got 60. So, okay. Um, so Dr. K mentioned a form of uh, meditation called yoga nidra to which he adds a positive reinforcement at the end. I was wondering how to do that. Also, is there another meditation for losing ego other than the laser beam one? It doesn't give me any sensations anymore. <laughs> okay. Good. Excellent. Okay. Um, so the first question is, if you're chasing meditate, if you're chasing experiences, so on stream, we did this me me meditation called charging the laser beam. And charging the laser beam, like everyone loved because they did it and they're like, whoa, it's like I have a laser beam that's like charging up in my forehead right? 
And then what happens is you run into the first problem of meditation, which is that you create an expectation. So as you look for the laser beam, your mind is no longer focused on your forehead. Your mind is focused on looking for the laser beam. And so like, then you don't find the laser beam because in order to find the laser beam, you have to be focusing fully on the forehead. So it's like the most common problem in meditation is that if you chase an experience in meditation, you won't be able to find that experience again. Most common problem. So people will meditate and before they understand what the F they're doing, they have some kind of really cool experience. And the next time they meditate, they want that again. They're like, okay, like we're going to do this this time. But expectation just ruins it. Expectation makes it difficult for you to focus the mind because your mind is hanging on to that expectation so you can't focus on the practice. Your mind becomes weak. It becomes dissipated. You're no longer concentrated, therefore no more experience. So let go of the expectation. Focus on the forehead. Just focus on the forehead. Focus on the forehead. The more you focus on the forehead, the better your meditation will be. And newsflash, folks, Charging the laser beam is just the first sensation in that practice. You do that practice for 15 years, all kinds of cool stuff is going to happen. Stuff that I can't even describe because no one is even going to understand what the F I'm saying. Like if I told you guys on stream, for those of you guys who have charged the laser beam, you know what I'm talking about. But if, for those of you guys who are relatively new, and you're like, what on earth does it mean to charge the laser beam in your forehead? Like just think about that for a second. Like no one is going to understand what that means. So I can't even tell you what happens because it's like literally not going to make any sense. So just charge the laser beam. Just focus on the practice and stuff will happen. Don't try to chase the sensation of the laser beam. Okay. All right. So we can also do yoga nidra at the end. Um, hey, can you give me any advice? How can I find my mantra to do mantra meditation? Mantras need to be given by like someone who has a certain amount of spiritual experience. Like you just don't find your, oh, well, I mean, I guess you can find your mantra. But I was given my mantra by a teacher and I've been doing that mantra for 16 years and it has helped me focus a lot. It's a very good one. Um, and then like, I've sometimes given mantras to people, which is not something that like I can do on a regular basis because it all has, de depends on the state of my mind. So I like, there's one person, for example, I tried to like find a mantra for them for like one year and I just couldn't because my mind was just not cooperating. Other people, I feel like I figured out. So mantras are generally like given by a teacher. So you, you don't find it. So sorry. You don't just find them. Um, so you have to find a teacher. Uh, so what would you recommend for breathing techniques for someone that has a deviated system, uh, septum? Really interested in what you were discussing with Raffle today regarding the notice uh, on change in nostril openings. So if you have a deviated septum, you shouldn't do anything that requires you to breathe out of one nostril. But there are a lot of meditation techniques that have nothing to do with your nose or breathing. So Kaish theorem is a great example. Like, so you can do any meditation technique that doesn't have to do with breathing. You can also do meditation techniques that have to do with breathing, just not a nostril preferential technique. So one technique that I teach, for example, is like Kapalpati, which is forceful exhalation. So it's kind of going like this. Like that. So you can do forceful exhalations. Like that doesn't, deviated septums don't matter. So let's do Kapalbhati together. Sit up straight. Okay. I need water. Man. Ugh. It's getting hot. I was cold. Now I'm hot. Hold on. Okay. 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 Back straight, boys. Wait, do you have, have you have I taught you guys how to sit up straight? Have we talked about this? Okay, I'm going to teach you guys how to sit up straight. It's easy. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. I promise you, easy. 
one of the most broken things that I ever learned or discovered. I don't know if anyone ever, ever taught me this, or I mean, or I just sort of figured it out. But easy trick to sitting up straight. Okay, let's just do it now. Yeah, absolutely. There's a proper way. I'm going to show you guys. Okay. Uh, I'm going to have to do this. I need to know whether y'all can hear me, okay? Okay, you guys can see me, right? All right. Yeah, take it all off. Let's do this. Besides you, is that true? Okay. So I'm going to teach you guys a trick, how to sit up straight. Okay. So if you guys can grab a pillow, grab a pillow. So. If you can sit cross-legged, I want you to sit cross-legged. And then notice what happens. Like, what does your body feel like doing? Can you guys sit like this? I can't read Twitch chat. So, okay. I'm gonna have to just like talk to him too. So like, if you guys see like, when I sit cross-legged, like, what do I feel like doing? Slouching, right? And so, it's gonna be hard to see, but let me try this chair. So if I sit in this chair, like, what do I feel like doing? Slouching, right? Just slouch. Like, that's normally how we sit. Okay? Now. How can I teach this? So what I want you guys to do is feel, so feel the slouch. And then, I want you to stand up. And notice what happens to your back when you stand. Right? So you straighten up. So now what I want you guys to do is sit like this. Actually, let's do this. Okay. So if you have a chair, I want you to move to the edge of the chair and then cross your legs in front. Okay. So I want you to sit at the edge. So like if you sit back, you're going to slouch. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Nipple spotted. Okay. So if you sit like you're going to slouch, right? So I want you to sit at the edge and then put your feet out in front of you. And then what happens to your... What happens to your back is if, if you sit forward with your feet straight in front of you? And then move back and slouch and sit forward. Then what happens? Your back straightens, right? So now what we're going to do, I'm going to show you guys this business. Okay. Cross-legged. And then we go into half lotus. What do you guys notice about my back? So here's cross-legged. Okay. Here's half lotus. What happens to my back? You don't have to do a half lotus, just watch me. Okay. And then full lotus. What happens? Right, so you guys see this? So this is full lotus. You don't have to do full lotus. I'll teach you guys how to do this without full lotus. Okay? So what's happening? So if you want to, sit cross-legged, and then sit on a pillow. And then notice what happens to your back. If you sit on a pillow and then do half lotus, that works great. Easy. Now I'm going to show you guys. Okay? So. 
slouched, right? Take the pillow. Okay. Sit on the pillow. I'm gonna fall off. What happens to my back? Half lotus? Easy. So, this is very important to understand. Anytime, so if we look at the progression of no lotus, so look at my knees. My knees are up here, my hips are down here, right? So left hand is above my right hand. Higher, lower. As I go into half lotus, what happens? They're about the same. And as I go into full lotus, this is lower than this hand. So all you need to do to sit up straight is to have your knees. So here's hip, here's knee. Vajrasan, thunderbolt pose. Right? So when our knees are lower, then our hips, our back will be straight. So let me show you guys the last one. So when I'm sitting in a chair, hips are back here, knee is up here. As I sit forward, knees go down, hips stay here. That simple. When I stand, knees are down here, hips are up here. It's easy to sit up, stand up straight, right? So if you want your back to be straight, all you need to do is have your knees lower than your hips. That's it. So if you're sitting, I know. And so this is important, right? It's physics. It's not math. It's physics. So like if, if you guys see like, like if you sit on a, so if you're in a chair, like sit on a cushion and elevate your butt and then it's like easy. Sitting up straight is not about posture. It's about physics. And if the weight of your body is distributed through your spine and into the ground, it'll be easy. You won't use any muscles. If your center of gravity is not along your spine, then you'll use muscles to prop yourself up and keep yourself from falling over, and then you'll get tightness over here and your posture's all messed up. That's it. Easy peasy. Okay? All right. Oh, this is great. I don't have to wear headphones because I'm not talking to anyone. Okay. I can't tell if the person who's asking me to demonstrate again is trolling me. Because that's annoying. Okay. So. Um, okay. You guys get that? So just keep your knees below your hips. And like, just, just try it. Okay. Just try it at home. So if you're in a chair, like put two pillows or three pillows under your butt, but not under your legs and see what happens to your back when you put three, when you sit on three pillows, take like two pillows and stick them on a chair and then sit in the chair and watch what happens to your back. Okay. All right. Armchairs. Yeah. Armchairs are comfortable to sit in, but terrible for posture. Sitting on a stool is good. Depends. Are your hips going to be lower than your knees when you sit on the stool? Okay. All right. So I'm getting a thousand questions, but we've done like three out of 60. So we're going to go back. Okay. We're going to answer like one or two more. Okay. Okay, so actually, this is another meditation technique. Just sit in different, like, degrees of ratios of hips to knees and pay attention to yourself and just see what your body feels like. Like, that is actually amazing meditation. Like, just sit and feel. So use one pillow, use two pillows, use three pillows. And just feel your body. Stand up. Sit on the edge of stairs. So like if you take a staircase, the second step from the bottom, or the third step from the bottom, sit there and let your feet be down the stairs. And see how your body feels. Got it? So 
she um so go ahead and, and just do that like do that on your own time easy peasy okay can you just clip your meditation portions of videos and make a youtube playlist of them i shall ask my mods to do that regarding meditation with meditation i can focus my mind and stop it from wandering what if I enjoy wandering in the dream world? I think that's why I'm not motivated in doing meditation. Yeah, of course you mo enjoy motivation in the dream world. Let me explain something to you guys. So we're going to, we're going to, this is the last question we're going to do. Okay. This person says, I enjoy like letting my mind wander in the dream world. Like, should I stop? Like meditation doesn't let me do that. So first of all, you can enjoy the dream world the rest of the time when you're not meditating. But I want to talk for a second about fantasy. So when you guys feel bad and you start to fantasize about something, like let's say that I failed a test and then like my mind wanders and I feel bad, right? And then my mind wanders to like the day that I'm going to be valedictorian and then everyone's going to see then. And then what is that, what does that do to my emotions? So when I fantasize, like, and I'm feeling bad, I'm so confused. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm talking about fantasy, right? Okay. So this, I'm going <laughs> to, that's hilarious. Okay. Okay. So what you need to understand is, and now she just ends <laughs> one day, I'm going to, I'm going to troll you fuckers. One day, one day, I'm going to just troll. I'm going to just end stream. Um, okay. So, oh man, I'm going to troll y'all so hard. One day the boomer comments will get to be too much. And my hatred from you, and I'll fantasize about one day I'm going to troll them. I'm going to teach Twitch twit chat, who's a boomer now? Who's the boomer now? Fantasy about revenge. Absolutely. So let's talk about fantasy. Okay. What you need to understand is that the motivation to change and the energy to create fantasies in your mind comes from one bucket. So when I like get humiliated at school, I feel a lot of negative emotion. And if I channel that emotion in the right way, I'm going to actually change my life. Like I'll be like, oh man, like I'm just like out of shape and those guys like run me down every day. So I got to work out and like get better and get healthy. But if I fantasize, it decompresses all of that negative emotion. The negative emotion goes away. Like, because you fantasize, right? And then you feel good at the end of the fantasy. That's what the fantasy is. That's why it's so addicting. So the energy to make a change in your life and the energy to fantasize comes from one bucket. So you have to decide where you, which, which way you want to use that energy. Do you want to use it to fantasize about your future? Or do you want to use it to make a change? And just notice this. Notice the things in your life that you fantasize about. Are those the things that you get stuck on or are those the things that you move forward on? The more you fantasize, the more it saps away your energy to actually make a change. Yeah, of course, they feel really good. They make you feel really good. And there's actually some neuroscientific evidence to support this theory. This has been sort of my understanding based on my own, like, looking at my mind and yoga and meditation. But if we look at the learning circuitry of the brain, if we look at the behavioral change circuitry of the brain, learning circuitry is very closely tied to your amygdala and limbic system. So our brain is wired to learn lessons from pain. So like if you, you know, are walking down the street and then like you slip on the ice and it hurts a lot, you are going to learn very quickly to pay attention to like ice on the street right? Like pain is like the, the greatest teacher. So if you like, let's say, so I, I mean, this happens sometimes where I'll work with someone who's has to do with like deal with infidelity in their marriage. And if someone has to deal with infidelity in their marriage, if someone's like partner is unfaithful, they're, they learn to like never trust anyone again. It's very hard for them to trust people in the future. And so like pain like teaches us and changes our behavior. They're like, fuck this. I'm never going to date anyone again. Like, I'm never going to fall in love. Never. It changes that person. It changes their behavior. And it all comes from pain. And when you have that pain from a negative experience, when you have shame and stuff like that, and then you fantasize, it shuts that part of your brain off, which is the same thing, the same thing that video games do. When you 
experience negative emotion and you play a video game, it shuts off that negative emotional part of your brain, which changes your motivational drive and and changes, like, deactivates the part of your brain that causes you to learn from your mistakes. Just think about that for a second. That our brain is wired to teach us how to learn from our mistakes, and that generally speaking, the way that we perceive mistakes is through pain, right? Like when you do something dumb or stupid or you hurt yourself or you hurt someone else, you feel bad and then you learn a lesson from it. Like think about the lessons that you learned and think about whether pain were involved. And then understand that like if you turn off the circuitry that has you experience pain, like how are you going to learn? And so now we understand really importantly, like why people who play video games make the same mistakes like over and over and over again. Like, you know, you should go to class, you know, you should study harder, you know, you should go to the gym, but you don't have any reinforcement from it because those negative emotions are being turned off. It's not your fault. You're not dumb. It's just, you're shutting off one of the biggest parts of your brain that teaches you to change. And fantasy does the same thing. That fantasy, like, calms the, those negative parts down. It sort of soothes you, makes you feel better, and then you're stuck. You're stuck. So do your best not to fantasize, or be careful with what you fantasize. My life got a whole lot better when I st stopped fantasizing about it. When I started focusing on doing things instead of, like, hoping and, like, wishing, like, oh, like, one day I'm going to do this or one day I'm going to do this, I just stopped. I mean, I didn't just stop. I would continue to do it. But I started changing the focus of my mind. I used dharana to change the attention and to focus the concentration and to concentrate on one thing. And then as I focused and concentrated on one thing, I batted fantasies aside. When fantasies would arise, you just, nope. I just focus on the thing that you're doing. Your life will change. Your life will change. Just in your mind, you've got a certain number of stat points, right? Like, actually not stat points. Let's call it like minerals or vespine gas. Like you have a certain number of minerals. And you can spend those minerals on creating change or you can spend those minerals on fantasizing. Same pool of energy. Same pool. I still play Dota. Whenever I can. Okay. Okay, last question. Okay, so I built up a routine of daily meditation. It's been good. However, I feel it's a bit simplistic and it hasn't changed in over three years. Currently, I'm most, mostly just doing a type of mindfulness meditation where I just breathe and try to notice my thoughts and bring my attention to my breath. What resources, different techniques can I investigate to expand where I am? Watch our steam, stream. I was going to say bro or woman or person. Just watch the stream. We're going to go through a lot of different meditation techniques. Um, Okay, so let's do one last meditation technique. So I think you guys, have, it, like we're going to do Shanmukhi Mudra and Brahmari Pranayam, which I know some of you guys liked and some of y'all didn't. Um, but this is going to be like a very intensive meditation. So we're going to try it. It's going to look fucking weird and you're going to feel fucking weird doing it until you actually do it. So this is a meditation called Brahmari Mudra and Shanmukhi, I mean, sorry, Shanmukhi Mudra and Brahmari Pranayam. So Shanmukhi Mudra is like this. I type it. Stop typing, chat. I'm going to type something. And if you guys if you guys type, you're going to lose it. No. No, it's going. No. 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 No one will know the answer. Okay. Okay. So Shanmukhi Mudra is a Sanskrit for closing of the nine gates. Okay. So This is Shanmukhi Mudra. So we have this thing called the pinna of our ear. So push the pinna up and then thumb inside the ear canal. Okay? So thumb inside the ear canal. So this is what Shanmukhi Mudra looks like. So corners of the mouth, right outside the nostrils, inside of the, the eyes, outside of the eyes. Okay, and then Brahmari Pranayam is 
We're, I'll tell you guys how to do it. So Brahmari Pra that's just the first phase. That's a mudra. That's a hand sign. That's like going like this. Like you guys know like these kinds of hand signs that people do when they meditate. That's a mudra. It's not the actual meditation. Brahmari Pranayam is bee's breath. So you're going to buzz like a bee or hum. Okay. We're going to put them together. Got it? So I'm going to walk you guys through it. We're going to do five breaths, okay? And it's going to be hard to tell what I'm doing because you're not going to be able to see me or hear me. So I'm going to just do it. You guys do it, okay? Okay. Okay. The finger part I probably should have done slower. Okay, so we're going to do I'm going to try to teach you guys again. Got it? So we'll do it again. Corners, outside, inside, side. And then thumbs, pin oh, pin of the ear, into the, into the ear canal. Plug it up, okay? Okay. All right. Okay, if you guys want an easier version, we'll do this. You can do above the eyebrows and be be below the eyes. Mm. One more. Okay. So, 
This is important. Focus is the mind. Remember, all of these are taught on us to focus the attention of your mind on one point. That's the purpose of all of these. They all have other pur- reasons too. But. So some of you guys did this. Some of y'all didn't. And like that's important to recognize. Because for those of you who didn't do it, think a little bit about why you didn't do it. And think a little bit about, did you think that this was silly? Did you think this is stupid? Did you think you didn't know how to do it? Did you think that, like, you may be doing it wrong? Like, did you even try? And really look at yourself. Right? Embarrassment? Good. Please notice. I mean, I offered this one because some people, this is a more engrossing or powerful meditation, but it's hard to do. Okay. All right. So I think that's going to be it, guys. I'm going to be out for the holidays for one week, I think. So I think I'll be streaming, actually, maybe for two weeks. So I'll be streaming Sunday, January 5th. So I think I will catch you guys in 2020. Um, not the earlobe. Earlobe is this. Push the pinna out and go inside. Okay? The reason that I try to type in Twitch chat is so that the people who have questions can use this thing called Google and get instructions from things called YouTube because sometimes I'm a shitty teacher. But, since you guys are trolling me and don't want me to type in Twitch chat and contribute, I guess those people are SOL. Um, I wish all of you guys happy, happy holidays. And um, let me just figure out uh, what are we... Who are we raiding? Let's raid someone. Um, Rackful? <laughs> 